Herzlich willkommen zu Nerdplay, dem Cosplay-Podcast hier auf Nerdizismus. In unserer nächsten Episode haben wir ein Interview mit Kinpatsu Cosplay für euch. Wir haben das Gespräch auf der CCXP in Köln aufgenommen und leider hat sich im Nachhinein herausgestellt, dass die Technik einfach nicht so wollte wie wir. Wir entschuldigen uns für die Qualität und versprechen, dass es bei der nächsten Folge besser wird. Jetzt aber erstmal viel Spaß mit Kinpatsu Cosplay auf der CCXP. <lacht> So we only have about um, 18 months of cosplaying and you already have almost 100 cosplays. How do you do that, time-wise? It's really difficult, um, especially like if we come to conventions and stuff like that. And with the competitions I've been doing as well, they, they tend to take up a little more time. But um, I generally have tried to do one cosplay every month. Uh, wow. Sometimes if it's like a smaller cosplay, um, like ones that I can just put together from clothes I can get from like a store or something like Impossible or anything like that, then I can do like maybe two a month. But yeah, I try and make at least one costume every single month. We have heard a little about you as a cosplayer. Um, we also know that you like anime and video games. We have a special question on our podcast. We always ask our guests, how do you rate yourself on a scale from one to ten? in your nerd factor. Like 10 is the highest nerd stuff ever, and what? Well, I'm just a little bit nerdy, not at all. <laughs> so um, I would say in like general nerddom mm -hmm. of like most of like the general fandoms, yeah. I, I put myself in maybe like a six, but when it comes to anime specific, <laughs> I'll put it at a 10, yeah. because I'm a, I'm a full weeb. We have already talked about a special topic that is um, something that you do on your YouTube as well. Um, crafting difficult wigs and giving people a little bit of help on how to do so. So we would um, of course like to talk about that as well because it's something that is a topic that interests us as well. So what is the most complicated wig you have ever created? I think one of the strangest wigs I ever had to make. There were a couple for the book I did. I think they're on screen right now. There's one. Yeah, you can look right Yeah, the character from Naruto. Uh, no, not Naruto, Boruto. <laughs> it's like a beak kind of hairstyle. It, it was one of the strangest things that I've ever had to make because you essentially have to make part midway through the head, go, going up in one direction and going down in the other direction. And that is just like physically impossible in normal circumstances. Mm -hmm. That was one of the strangest ones. And the other one is probably um, Jinx from Teen Titans. Oh, yeah. Her hair goes up into these like giant spikes on the side and it is just some of the craziest shapes I've ever had to make. And I used probably like two cans of got to be <laughs> like at least on that week because it had to like defy gravity yeah. and it was it was a pretty intense week to try and create do you also build something underneath like uh, some craft supplies that you take to um, secure the shapes so um i do that for Things like ponytails. Um, ponytail wigs, I'll normally make a frame to make sure that it stays upright um, and use some styrofoam inside to give it a shape. But for wigs like the Jinx wig and that wig that looks like a beak, I actually just used hair inside. I just tease it and comb it back and make hair shapes inside to get the wig to stand up. So it's a little bit of both, whatever works for the specific project you're working on. So, uh, is there a wig that you would say is your favorite, like a baby or your heart <laughs> project? A heart project? I mean, I can probably speak about a certain style of wig that I love. Um, it's Arda wig and it's called a Matilda. It's a lace front. Um, it's, it can be styled in any direction, which is great. So, if, if I ever am given the opportunity to get a Matilda, 
I get a bunch of lights. This was um, out the packet this morning. I put it on. I just blow away the uh, curls out, and it's done. Like, I love those yeah. wigs so much. So they are my ultimate favorite wig, yeah. and I will get one Other whenever I can for a project. Yeah. <laughs> Backstage, she told the us that your name can Patsy just means like blonde in Japanese. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, um, so my cosplay name, uh, I was, when I was thinking of the name, I was trying to think of something that's like, yeah. A defining feature about me as a person, like I knew some people um, use their gamer tags for their cosplay mm -hmm. names. Mm -hmm. And people were like, I'm blonde, so yeah, I'm like, calling yeah, myself blonde. Which is like, like all I've got, so I'll, I'll be blonde cosplay. <laughs> so that was where that came from. Yeah. But do you still like your name? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's grown on me. I mean, I kind of was a little weird to get used to in the beginning because, you know, it, it seemed like the separate thing. But it's kind of like part of me now, like seven years later, you know? Is it a frequently asked question where the name comes from? <laughs> I don't think a lot of people know that it's a Japanese word, or they don't know what the Japanese word means. A lot of people who've watched fairy tale know what it means, because that's actually where I found out what the meaning was as well. And I was like, okay, I'll maybe use that as my, my cosplay name. When we were talking about the wigs just a few minutes ago, you meant, already mentioned your book. This is because you have a book on sale on your homepage. Yes, um, I recently did a book um, to help everyone with um, very basic, all the way up to really crazy wig styling techniques. So the, the book kind of goes over like how to cut wigs, how to heat style them, how to trim fringes like easily, all the way up to making crazy shaped wigs. Um, all the wigs that are in that image on screen now are have their own tutorials in the book, so how to make big volumey wigs, um, how to make ponytails, how to style anime spikes and stuff like that. So it was um, something I wanted to do because it, I've, I've never seen a wig book done before. Yeah, right. So I wanted to try and do something that was a little bit different and like help people out because I know a lot of people always ask, oh, how do I style a wig? How do I do this? How do I do that? And I was like, here you go. Yeah. Hopefully this will be helpful. I have done a couple of um, wig tutorials on my YouTube as well. We've got the ponytail tutorial up on YouTube, um, I think I've got. Oh, we have a screenshot of that yeah. as well, I think. Yeah. In the presentation. Oh yeah, this is a pretty tell tutorial. Yeah. <laughs> so I know a lot of people have been using it, and they've said it was helpful, and that makes me like so happy when I can see other people using the tutorials. It like. I feel like I'm doing something right. And I'm a big fan because it says it's only 9 minutes 20 long. I hate <laughs> tutorials that are like 30 minutes and yeah. I'm like skip to the important part already. It's hard, hard to like. I know. Dense stuff. Oh, and I love these tutorials that say, oh, this cosplay is made in 30 minutes. And you're like, oh, I will do this. And then you see, you need this, you need this, you need this. This and this and this and it's impossible if you don't have any material for this. So we already talked about your book and your YouTube channel. But what is the main difference for you making some stuff for your book or a video? So, um, like you said, sometimes YouTube videos can be a little bit too long. Yeah. Um, but you also can't, can't you can't you can't really get through everything as comprehensively as you would want to in a nine-minute YouTube tutorial versus. Mm -hmm in a 100 page book. So that's why I like to do the books because I feel like um, I, I put stuff out on YouTube as a way to kind of help people um, who would like to just get the help for free, um, who just kind of want to use the resources available. I mean, I, that's how I started out cosplaying was looking at YouTube tutorials. So I want to, I want to be able to um, contribute to that and give back to people as well. I would never want to like completely put stuff behind like a paywall and like exclude people. I want to keep like helping people and teaching them. And then the books are like, just the next level of that, where it's like, instead of this nine minute tutorial, it's like 10 pages with 100 photos of every single individual step that goes into creating something with a written explanation next to it so that people can slowly go through it and try and find um, what they're looking for and how to do things. And then it also has like the slightly um, more small details in it, like how to cut stuff. I mean, you, you can't go over like how to cut, how to, heat style, how to do all those things in one single video, um, mm -hmm. it's just, it would be like an yeah. hour yeah. long, <laughs> which and is it sounds long. like a massive amount of time. The other, the other thing, thing that's nice about the books and is different from YouTube videos is that yeah. in a book, it's kind of like a compilation mm -hmm. of a whole lot of tutorials, where as a YouTube video, it's just one topic or one section of something that you can do, um, and the books are like this 
basically all the knowledge that I could put together on wigs in one spot. It's like a an, an little encyclopedia for people then to like uh, find out how to do something that they're struggling with with regards to wig styling. It's also very handy if you need to repeat a step because it didn't work out because yeah. you don't have to search around and play it back and stuff like that but you have the page in front of you and you can yeah. just go step by step and if you did not get the step right you can just go one page back and just I think it's really handy if you do a lot of wig styling I mean if you want to do that exact wig that's nice it's perfect if you just need lots of knowledge for lots of different cosplays I think the compilation idea is a really nice one so I would say that like sometimes it is nicer to do YouTube videos because sometimes if you're doing just like pictures of steps you yeah. don't really fully understand what's going on whereas a YouTube video and filming something you see every step involved you see the movements that are involved in like teasing the wig whereas in a photo it's kind of like point A and point B <laughs> and in a video you're, yeah, a video, you're seeing everything. everything you're seeing how like violent I'm being with the wings <laughs> like tearing through pieces and stuff so I think it's a more immersive experience yeah. to be able to watch stuff on YouTube so there's like pros and cons to both books and YouTube videos on their own and definitely, that's why we we think it's great that you do both because there are lots of different kinds of people who need different kinds of help. Yeah. And some people just like to listen as well. Like some people are not into reading, and some people just want to see photos. Some people just want to um, turn the volume off and like watch what happens in the video. Yeah. So, and what would you say is the best advice you've ever given in the book and on YouTube regarding this? That's a tough one. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's a tough one, one really. Tough. Um, but maybe there are like a lot of questions about a certain wig and a lot of people say, oh, thank you so much, they yeah. got me on this wig. And I think one of the that. biggest, well, I think it's the, the frame within the ponytail is something that mm -hmm. people have said that like, that's helped so much because what happens a lot of the time people are styling ponytail wigs is that the, the ponytail has no support so it just starts like flopping down to the side. Um, and that support system that sits inside will keep it up no matter what is going on. Like that is, it's going to be up there. <laughs> there's no, um, there's no taking it down afterwards. So it's, it's, I, and I've seen so many people use it for like different things. And like I've seen people use that same frame structure to make horns, to make oh, wow. horns and stuff. That's and they've like modified it because they see that it works for something. And then they've just changed it up and, uh, used it for other cosplay accessories and stuff like that, which I always think is so cool, is that when people take something and then modify it, make it their own, and change it. Apply what they yeah, learn. Exactly. Shall we uh, talk a little bit about your staff in cosplaying? Because we now talk a lot about uh, the advices you've given and your best and greatest wigs, but everyone starts small, right? Yeah, uh, I mean, I didn't even use a wig for my first cosplay. <laughs> but what we, we done today, we, we both sporting our natural hair because we thought it was going to be awfully hot in here, but it's actually nice and cool, so tomorrow we can go crazier with our cosplays. I mean, I, that's the one thing, I, I, know how to style, I know how to style wigs, I still don't know how to style my own hair. I don't know how to style human hair. Like, <laughs> well, I'm a hairstylist, so it's that's just like, natural. Yeah, it's just like completely different to me, because like, wigs, I, I tried to curl my hair once and the curls just like fell out within like 10 minutes and I was like, yeah, I'm just going to wear a wig now. <laughs> so I've given up on my own hair. <laughs> Wigs are my life now. Do you still remember what your first cosplay was? Yeah, my, my first costume um, that I did for a convention was actually Misa from Death Note. Mm -hmm. So I had blonde hair at the time, um, I actually had black fringe. So my, my way of getting around that was I took the piece of fringe underneath that was black kind of rolled it up into like yeah. a little sausage and pinned it <laughs> and got like one of those clipping hair extensions and just kind of clipped it underneath the blonde parts of my friends to try to hide the black section and I, I just got the clothes that I had in my, my cupboard and got dressed up like a little bit gothic and went to the convention as Misa and I had a, I had a great time and I, I that then afterwards I was like okay well maybe I can start making my own stuff and maybe I should start looking at trying to get some wigs and like I, it, it, it kind of, it, it was gross, like, right? It's like sticking your toe in the water to test it and then just diving in. <laughs> like it was, I had such a great time and I've never stopped since then. Yes, that's really sweet because we also um, did a lot of closet cosplay and we also do casual cosplay on our blog and we always encourage people to just try something, just 
um, wear whatever you feel good in and whatever makes you feel powerful and then just go from there and then maybe you start sewing something or maybe you buy something that you feel comfortable in and then it just starts to grow into that kind of passion that makes you this horrible perfectionist I know, I know. <laughs> yeah i mean I, when i started I, I just used things in my closet um for the next costume i decided okay i'm gonna try and sew a skirt and i'm gonna try and sew a tie but i still use um like my own button-up shirt that i got from the store um I used like my own like schoolgirl 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 socks, what are words today, mm -hmm. um, and just put together like half items that I bought, half items that I made, and slowly worked up to eventually um, altering items and then starting to make stuff from scratch. So it was like it was a really gradual progression, and some of my first costumes were. <laughs> um, so, yeah, the first costume that I completely sewed, I think the one sleeve came out to my shoulder there, and the other one came out to my neck this side. So it took a while before I could measure things properly and not just wing it. And I still struggle with sewing like seven years later. It still yeah. hasn't really gotten that much easier. So <laughs> I could imagine that um, since you have a rather curvy figure that you have to alter a lot of things to just fit really snugly. Yeah, I mean, I basically, um, I love wearing corsets under my stuff, so I have to kind of custom make everything for myself um, when I've got my corset on. Um, so I love, like to make my own patterns from tape a lot. Or alternatively, I like to start with clothes that I know fit me. So I'll take a lot of stuff out of my closet. Oh yeah, then that's also doing yeah. And then you just trace <laughs> around whatever you've got. That's exactly how I did this. I, I took some leggings and a t-shirt, I laid them on the on the fabric and I just traced around and I was like, that's gonna fit. It works, if it's stretch fabric, it work. I mean, this was also like a dress I had um, in my closet and I just traced around it and sewed it together and it fits. Did you sew the pants as well? No, these are bought. So this is like a combination of bought pants. I mean, why bought on the bottom? <laughs> bought on the bottom and made on the top. Nice. Do you also have an advice for everyone who's trying to get into cosplay? I mean, I think a lot of people are very apprehensive about it and they overthink it. Yeah. And they're like, oh, I don't know how to start. I don't really know. Well, there are a lot of really perfect cosplayers nowadays. I know, so it's a lot difficult. Of idol. It is difficult. I mean, I guess I, I came from a, a country where it was just starting out too. So like at the time, um, seven years ago, we only had about 30 cosplayers in the country <laughs> or something like that. There, we have like, we didn't even have that many events. It was like one event a year. Mm. So the rest of our events were like picnics in the park in costume. Oh, um, that's yeah, so that's cute. cute. I, I really liked, um, I'm, I'm really thankful that I, I got essentially raised in a cosplay yeah. community that was pure. And like yeah, the most that was no form of it where we were just like, we're gonna go to the park and nobody's gonna know what we're doing, but it's okay. Like, cause that's how, yeah, it sounds amazing. Like, you're meeting in, friends and yeah, it was like, came in some stuff. Like, we had and no notion cosplay. of like yeah. being cause famous yeah, right. or like, have we, we had no idea that anyone can make money from cosplay, that we, people would be going overseas and people would be coming up from overseas to our country. So, mm. at the time, it was just, we wanna dress up. Because we're weird and it's fun. And <laughs> I think a lot care. of people here started like that as well. There is something in uh, Düsseldorf here. Um, there's a big Japanese community, so they have a Japan Day once a year. And um, when people started dressing up there, like 10 years ago or something, it was still really weird. And now it's one of the biggest cosplay events in this area. And like everyone is going there. It's so mainstream. Right do you now. think that, like do you find that the, the people in general within Germany have like got more of an understanding of what cosplay is now? Yeah. So when you go out and you're doing a photo shoot, do people give you like weird looks still or is Yeah, that that's always happening. We came here by train today. <laughs> and it was, it was, it was, it was amazing <laughs> because like she's Captain Marvel and everybody knows Captain Marvel, but I'm from the new Shira cartoon and nobody knows it, so it was like, look, there's Captain Marvel and uh, and a girl and, and another one. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it, it's still kind of weird for the non-mainstream costumes, but things like Marvel, DC, um, or any kind of big movie or the Disney characters, stuff like that, um, people are 
really positive nowadays. I I feel. Yeah. Um, that of course there's still gonna gonna be people like, oh, is it carnival already? Um, but <laughs> you know that's just because it's a really big thing here in Cologne as well. So yeah. For a long time, a lot of people didn't understand what cosplay was mm -hmm. within my country, and I think with the introduction of um, comic books and stuff becoming more mainstream, um, and we got our first Comic Con last year. So now everybody knows, like, because of Comic Con, um, if you say, "Oh, it's like Comic Con," they're like, ah, "Okay, I understand now." Now, and because of that, they kind of understand what cosplay is, and it's becoming a little bit more normal. More people are wanting to try it out and start. But I mean, I think that's that is what the bottom line is about wanting to start cosplay, you just have to do it. Mm. You just need to do it, whether it's a costume that you buy online, whether it's renting one from like the, the party shop, I know a lot of people uh, rent out suits and stuff now, um, whether it's uh, making one from clothes you've got in your cupboard, or just diving in and trying to make something from scratch. You just start, do what you can, do, what, do something that makes you excited, See oh, what yeah. happens and see if you enjoy it. And the excitement sure. is really important, is. right? When I'm listening to um, an audio book or when I'm reading a new book or see a new TV show, everything, and I get really excited about this and then I'm like, oh, I want to cosplay. This, this is amazing. And then you just dive into it, right? I would also like to add as a plus size person that it's not that important that you exactly look like the no, character. Not at all. Just make yourself look like it. And yeah. especially just um, as you said, um, you can wear a corset or you can wear padding to make bigger breasts or a butt that isn't there. And um, I think that okay, it's depending on the event, but most of the time the cosplay community is really nice to each other. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, in South Africa as well. Like, I think we're also open about it because like. South Africa, there's so many people of color there that it's it's really awesome to see people just not care and just push the boundaries and do something that makes them happy. It doesn't matter what the color of your skin is, it doesn't matter what size you are, it doesn't matter what race or even if you're human or not, it doesn't matter. <laughs> like the cosplay will bring everyone together. Cosplay is such an amazing thing. I mean, I have always just found it so incredible. I can go to any country in the world and if people are cosplayers, I can relate to them. Oh, yeah. And if you feel like you Known your whole life because mm. you have a car together, so, like, yeah. and that's just the coolest thing. Since you talked about race, there is this big issue, especially in the American cosplay community, about black facing. Is that something that you in your country, where there are also racial problems in the past, is that something that is talked about a lot? Well, yeah, we we actually um, obviously with uh, our history, um, we had apartheid. Um, we were, I mean, that's like only. I mean, 24, 25 years ago that that ended. Um, so things like black facing, it's still very prominent. Um, it's still like a sore point. Um, and outside of cosplay, we've had issues um, with that. So it's been talked about in the media and stuff, I remember. I mean, it, it gets taken a little too far sometimes. Um, there was a story, I remember at some point, it was for like, it was not cosplay related, but it was like um, for a Halloween party, someone painted themselves purple with glitter and they said that that was black facing so you see I think in South Africa it's taken a little bit too far to the one side but I understand I do understand where it comes from because um, it has been part of our history so um, I, I know that a lot of um, people from European countries and people from um, the, the Asian countries they they said that black facing is like a, a new phenomenon that well, is not really spoken about so much. I think that um, since in, in your country um, more different races live closer to each other, I think not here we do have this, but not so much in the in the cosplay community. It's still really quite white. Uh, I mean, there are lots of people of color and they are very welcome and included, but there is not so many um, darker skinned or um, really people of African descent. We are more, we have lots of immigrants from places like Turkey and North Africa and more like a tan skin. And so um, I think that um, the conversation is just not as intense because we do not have so many people speaking up against it. Yeah, I mean, that's the one thing I know is it's happened in the States a lot where it, people just do it and they get the backlash for it. I think the thing is about South Africa is that we don't really speak about it because nobody's really doing it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not something 
that the people there do because they, they kind of know that, that you shouldn't. shouldn't because it's obviously like a big part of it. So yeah, but I mean, we, we have very, very overly cautious people as well. Um, I know a lot of the time we've had in, like we have a local class like group on Facebook and they'll ask, um, so I think it's Dark Link. Mm -hmm. He's like completely, completely black. So a lot of people have even said, okay, well, am I allowed to do that? Am I allowed to paint myself like pitch black? If it's like not, not a brown yeah, not, skin color, not but brown, but real yeah, black. Like, that's how that's that's how cautious they are about that kind of stuff because of the history that we've got in South Africa, and because it is so prominent there, um, the racial tensions and stuff like that. So people people I find in South Africa are very aware of it and very conscious of it. So it hasn't happened. There hasn't been like a big drama or anything for us. Yeah. But to break this uh, yeah, tension, very <laughs> I'm, I'm really sorry, it's just something that interrupted No, no, yeah. it's totally fine. Um, and I think we have to talk about things like yeah, that's that's different. Right, to talk about. Especially on stage yeah. with three white women. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any cosplay that involves the full body paint? I, it was one of my first costumes, um, and the regret is still in me to this day <laughs> because I found out why I hate body paint so much <laughs> because it was, um, it was, I think the first time I'd ever done armor, the first time I'd ever done like my own full costume, like I, I did Queen of Pain from a game called Dota um, and I had to paint myself completely blue. I woke up at like four in the wow. morning and went to my friend's house and she helped me paint myself and I helped paint her because she was also going as a blue character <laughs> and um, we got to the convention and I was covered in body paint that I hadn't set properly, and everything I touched turned blue, oh, and my whole costume turned blue, and I felt really gross and really terrible, and I have never done full body paint again. But I'm sure you could afford an airbrush gun by I, now. I, yeah, no, I, I have yet to try airbrush paint. I've heard it is amazing, the oil, the, not oil-based, um, the... Latex-based. The, the best color? Alcohol-based. That's The alcohol-based alcohol yeah. ones are apparently really good. Um, the other uh, issue I have with body paint is that it comes up on the costume, so I'm like yeah, scared right. to. But the but the alcohol based are there costumes any... as well. Yeah. It's just a little irritating if you have sensitive skin. Okay, yeah, because I would love to try that again. I'm just like, I think I'm so scarred from the experience <laughs> of like having blue paint everywhere for like a week afterwards that I'm. Yeah, like, no, I did a poison ivy once, no. so <laughs> I'm I had the same <laughs> green. You just need to buy a weird good fixing powder or fixing spray. But do you powder your whole body? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, like you like put it on the floor and then just like roll it. Mm. So, like, oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> or you have some sprinkling on the floor. on the floor and you're like take me now. Yeah. When I did my death guard uh, for the Project Eden Blake group last year, I did colorful stockings, colorful arm pieces because that is the worst pa place to put body paint yeah, on. Yeah, it's in your armpits. Mm. Nobody thinks about your armpits, but you gotta paint them. I mean, everything's... armpits and between the fingers. Uh, oh, yeah. and the ears, the back, the back side of the yeah, ears. That too. You know, it's just, it's not a fun time. But at least, if you have the stockings on your arms and you have the stockings on your legs, all you have to paint is your chest and your face. So it's like a ten percent of what you would initially be having to paint, which is okay. If we're on the topic of makeup. How um, did you? Um, learn to do your makeup for your cosplay. Is it something that you just um, just by trial and error, or do you have some natural talent? Natural talent, or <laughs> some special YouTube gurus? I mean, I have become like more obsessed with makeup as time has gone on. Like, I'm yeah. a huge fan of um, Jeffree Star. And oh, it, it was in my head. Like, should I ask about Jeffree Star? Star? <laughs> I just ordered because like, like, everyone a super bright, colorful palette because it's perfect for cosplay so stuff. Amazing. So. Yeah, I'm, I, I've become like super into makeup now, but I mean, initially, oh, I look back at some of my makeup now, and I'm like, wow, <laughs> wow, this, this is not good, this is not good. Especially how I used to do my eyebrows, which were non-existent. Oh, yeah, and so I've learned to embrace the brows. Um, I think uh, I, I kind of dived more into makeup stuff when, again, I wanted to try and do a makeup book. Mm. Uh, I did that earlier this year, so I wanted to try and um, take my makeup level up a little bit. I, I redid a lot of the makeups for characters that I'd done previously. Um, for example, I had a Shigo cosplay, um, and I redid my makeup for that completely, and the before and after was just yeah. shocking. <laughs> and I, I had um, a Siri cosplay as well, which I redid the makeup for. I wanted to do, like, because, you know, I don't know if you guys have ever seen this, but you see some cosplayers, 
or yourself. I, I, I saw this in myself where you look at your photos and you look exactly the same in every photo. Yeah, right. The makeup's the same in every mm. single photo and it's just like, you're going so far with the costume and you're going so far with your wig. But why are you not doing your makeup differently it. for every character? You're, you're doing your makeup like it's your own makeup every day, yes. where you should be looking at the character, looking at the makeup things Especially that... Especially embracing um, some features in the face that you might not highlight on your own face, <laughs> yeah. like making your nose look bigger, yeah. making your cheeks look chubbier, things that you would normally not do in your um, in your normal makeup, yeah. you have to do for a character to look more like Exactly, it. like when I did my Siri makeup, I actually put like eyeshadow right in between my nose and my eyebrows here to make them look like angrier. <laughs> <laughs> like there's weird things that you can do for makeup that make such a big difference. I mean, even if it's just the way that you change the shape of your eye with makeup and do less makeup and changing the shape of your brows and, and stuff like that, it goes a long way. And I was resistant to it for a while because I was like, I didn't think it was that important. But then when I did it and when I looked into doing more makeup stuff and trying to go further with my makeup stuff, I look back now on what I used to do and I'm like, wow, what have I been doing? You improved a lot. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. That's, that's the thing about cosplay though as well that I absolutely love is that you will never stop improving. It doesn't matter if you've been cosplaying for 10 years or 10 months, there, there will, will always be things that you're going to learn and improve on and that's something that I think has kept me in the hobby for as long as it has is that I'm constantly learning and I love to learn new stuff and new techniques and it's it's always nice to have that little bit of a challenge. Nothing ever makes like easy in cosplay, I think. It's always just like the next level of challenging. Yeah, I can feel that. I have an Elsa cosplay from Frozen and I did it five years ago or so. And now I'm like, oh my god, this was horrible. What have I done? Are there also cosplays you would like to redo? Yeah, I mean, there, there, there's a lot. Of, yeah, a lot, right? <laughs> so maybe at this point, because, you know, I look at costumes from like three months ago and I'm mm. like, oh my god, what was I doing? Because you start to learn and you start to get better and neater at sewing and neater at painting. And costumes I made one year ago, I feel like I'm not happy to wear anymore because yeah. I'm like, oh, this isn't a blip. Well, but one year ago for you is 10 cosplays ago. So that's <laughs> the <other laughs> place to learn. Right, yeah, I mean, it's also like, um, I think as soon as you start pushing yourself more, the improvement starts happening. And if you just take, like, I, I know with the costume I made recently, which I'll be wearing tomorrow, the sewing I've done on that costume now versus the sewing I did on my last costume, it's like so far apart because it took my time with this one to try and get it right. I redid things like four or five times. <laughs> Is it the one uh, on your Instagram with the single panel? Yeah, the, the Reptalia cosplay. Oh, yeah, it, it was. It was interesting. <laughs> I, I just read in your caption, I did not find a ripped shirt, so I made one myself, and I was like, that's insane. No, Why would you do I that? I tried to get a pin tuck foot because I wanted it to be easier, but eh, I just ended up doing yeah, it. Yavana and I were fanboarding about this because we just sat there and were like, wow. Well, I mean, I, I, was, oh, I tried. Oh. I tried to get around that too because I'd, I'd done like test swatches, yeah. and I'd done the stitching test swatches with the two pieces of fabric mm -hmm. stitched together. And I did fake stitches to emulate it, and I took them to my partner Eric, and I was like, "Which one looks better?" And he's like, "That one, the stitch one." I was like, "Okay, thanks, that's great." Yeah. And <laughs> thanks, I hate it. Thanks, Eric. <laughs> so um, when I see this picture that is just up on the projection, um, you have the big ears on it, and you do that a lot in um, on your homepage as well for the um, the the models that you have. Um, where you can also buy um, the tutorial um, for um, stuff like that. How do you make sure that they stay in the right place on the wig? Oh, the, the ears. So, I, I don't know if you guys know those little extension clips that like, yeah. are on the back of the extensions. They're sometimes inside the wigs. I just glue, hot glue one of those. Oh, and that's enough for the, for yeah. the whole big... Yeah, no, it, it, it wow. anchors itself at the top here. So, I mean, if you're swishing your head around, it might flop around a little bit. You could probably put a second one, mm -hmm. like, lower down. But, like, I'll have my Raftalia ears on tomorrow, and they're the same. Um, they just got one clip here and over here, and they, they hang in there. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, it's, it seems too simple to be, to, to be true, true right? but <laughs> yeah. it actually works. It's just because the heaviest wig I ever wore was um, just with a really high um, bun and I felt like the whole weight was pulling backwards and I always kept 
um, feeling like it was slide off. It didn't because I glued it really tightly, but it felt like my head was just being yeah. flowing. Yeah, and I've back. had that before too. I, I had a ponytail week for I think uh, Jana, Star Guardian Jana, um, and she had this huge ponytail. And since then, I, I learned that you can basically thin out fifty percent of the hair, and that makes it like <laughs> so much lighter because it still looks like a lot of hair, but it's not. Um, so if you leave all the hair on the ponytail, it's really heavy and pulls back. But there's also something called a wig grip, and it's like a big, it's like a velvet strap, velcro strap that goes around your head. Mm. And apparently the wig is supposed to grip onto that instead of your scalp and distribute the weight evenly. Um, Arda Wig sells them, I think you can probably get them on Amazon or eBay. Um, it's just called a wig grip and it's supposed to help. I know a lot of drag queens use them for their giant mm. wigs. So. And because a lot of them don't have hair. It's yeah, like yeah that, should, that too. So yeah, you can get wig grips and that should help distribute the weight of the wig more evenly. So it does feel like you're dying. Although I guess at the end of the day, if your wig's really heavy, your neck yeah. hurt anyway. But that <laughs> sound. This is the cause alley. <laughs> <laughs> so is there um, some kind of um, trick that you have for the transporting of wigs like this, especially the bigger ones when you aren't traveling. Just so, put it in pot. <laughs> yeah. So um, something I've seen people do before is instead of putting them in like a packet, they'll put them in a structured box, and the box will help protect the styling a bit um, during travel. What I'll normally do is end up restyling them mm -hmm. as soon as I get there because it just you know wigs wigs get a little messed up in travel. But I have seen. Um, People like, I know her name is Cowbutt Crunchies. She does insanely styled wigs. Um, like, I know she's done a Pokemon series of wigs, which so is like a Charizard wig on fire and a Bulbasaur wig with like flowers all over it, all made from hair, and it's insane. And she puts them inside packets, and um, the packets help protect, like, like uh, not, not plastic packets, like um, the shopping bags, the cardboard ones, or the, the, the paper ones that are more structured. And she'll carry them onto the plane with her. Like hand luggage um, to help protect them, or like can, a dog you take. Yeah, yeah. Or you can um, help stuff the wig inside with like, tissue paper or newspaper or something to help keep it shaped as well. Um, and I, I think that will help with the transporting of wigs that are very styled that you don't want to have to do again when you get there. You know, so all in all, the transport isn't easy. No, it's it's not easy. I mean, it's the same as um, armor and props. You kind of have to pad them or pack them in big boxes and stuff to get them from point A to point B. Do you have any funny airport stories with your props? Oh, uh, so when we were doing um, C2E2 this year for the competition, uh, I had my sister battle cosplay, and um, I packed in some red airbrush paint. Uh, and I was really worried because I saw on the box that um, TSA at the American airport had checked my my, ba my bags, and I was like, oh my god. They've cut out my wiring, they've done something, they've broken my costume. And I opened up the box where they had all the tape on, and I saw my plastic packet that I had my paint in, and there was just red everywhere. <laughs> and nothing else had been disturbed in the box, so I think the TSA agent had opened the box, seen the paint, and was like, ah, <laughs> I'm not gonna pay enough to deal with this. Um, the paint had gone kind of all over my costume inside the box. So it didn't that, work as weathering. <laughs> I had to make it work as weathering. But um, one of the pieces that I had was this big piece of fake fur inside the box. Now I was I was panicking at this point in, in the middle of the airport, and I pulled out this piece of fur with like red all over it, and people were staring at me in the airport <laughs> because I had this big furry thing with red paint on it. And people were like. What is happening yeah. right is now? That a like, death this is for cosplay. <laughs> Don't worry, this is not real. Like I think people thought it was like a PETA protest or something, getting ready to like throw my <laughs> red paint at someone. <laughs> that is exactly the kind of story I was talking about. Yeah, yeah it, it was an interesting day, and I had red paint all, on my hands, but I had to put the thing back in the box and just be like, okay, we're done here. Well, I'm a fan of learning by my own mistakes. What was the biggest mistake you've ever done on a wig and you were like, oh, oh or on a I hate everything. Yeah, I mean it's a pretty it's a pretty simple one for the wigs. Um I cut it too short. Oh no! <laughs> it took like two minutes yeah. and I cut the wig too short and I was like, okay, I have to have a new wig now. <laughs> it was and it was a specialized wig, it wasn't like a normal wig, it was a rogue from X-Men. So oh. it was a two-tone wig oh, no. that I had specially ordered. And I made it like this much too short, and it just took like two seconds because 
because I wasn't paying attention. I was cutting too much off, and I was like, okay, I look like I, I look like a small boy now, and this is not what I'm supposed to look like. So I had to throw the wig away, and I had to glue two wigs together <laughs> to fix the mistake I'd made. So it, I mean, it happens. Yeah, it happens. No matter how many years you cosplay, you can cut a wig too short. <laughs> Really yeah, it doesn't take much. Yeah, I think when you cut a wig, it's really important to try it on first yeah. and not doing it on um, on a head, right? Yeah, I mean, I did this on my head. <laughs> I was just not having a good oh, no. time. I was standing in the mirror and I was like, one, two, three, oh, okay. This is not looking so good anymore. And I tried to do on this side and went back to this side and I was like, no. <laughs> it's over. I think in the in the old animated series, she had like a really layered cut that just yeah. spikes yeah. in every direction. You might have pulled off that one. I could have one. reused that. It was just, we're gonna jump gender bend rogue or something. Yeah. Yeah. It was. Yeah. It just it just went from bad to worse because you had to fix it, and then you kind of have to just accept it and give up and move on. <laughs> yeah. It's it's it happens. And do you also have like a big mistake you made on a costume or prop or something? Mm, yeah, um, <laughs> the same sister battle costume that I missed the paint on. Um, we were moving house, and uh, Warbler is a heat activated oh, yeah. plastic. Um, and while we were moving, it was pretty hot. It was summer, and um, we had the whole box of the entire costume on the back of us going a Bucky. <laughs> Like out in the sun in the plastic covers, I didn't even think about it. Like it wasn't even something that we considered. Mm -hmm. and by the time we kind of now driven the 30 minutes home, um, after moving the boxes with the sun bearing down on my props, my sword and the I look, I looked at the box and like, what is happening? The sword was this shape. Oh, no, <laughs> it was this shape in the box, lying over everything else inside the box. The breastplate had it concaved inside on the side, like inwards, and I was like, okay, that's my um, championship costume destroyed in 30, 30 minutes from point A to point B. So that was, that broke my heart like a little bit, but we did manage to fix it, get one more photo shoot out of it. Um, so glad. It's a little wrecked anyway. I mean, that thing has been like <laughs> to three, three countries and like reused over two years and added to so it's seen its day and it's mm. it's had its time but it got one more photo shoot and we did manage to get it fixed enough but yeah don't leave your cosplay props if they're warbling in the sun because it will melt into a puddle of nothing most uh, other props that are not warbler might um, have um, bad paint jobs after the sun is yeah well. they bubble yeah. they bubble up or they get lighter at the patches where the sun hits them some paint might even crack so yeah don't leave your stuff in the sun <laughs> don't be like me <laughs> and if you're shooting in the sun just uh, take a couple of uh, pauses in the shadows so do you usually store all your cosplays and wigs or do you just use them a couple of times and then sell them <laughs> or Give us some yeah, um, so we we, have, we do run out of space pretty quickly when I'm doing the bigger armor pieces because there's only so much armor you can have in one spot. The fabric ones are kind of easy to keep because you can fold them up and put them away. The armor one tubs, like two giant plastic tubs, they're a little harder to keep around. So um, like I'm never going to get what I put into the costume back, if you know what I mean, in terms of like I can't sell the costume for the value that I made the costume for. Mm. No, Nobody on my country is going to buy it. I can't ship it somewhere because the shipping is so expensive in my country too. So what I like to do is I'll chat to my friends and my close friends and I'll say, okay, well, do you want this costume? Because I would prefer to see the costume get used again and have some new life breathed into it than just be like, okay, well, I'm going to put this in fire now and burn it or something. <laughs> like I want... I, I think want that would be a fire hazard. I know. Do that. I, I kind of want to burn the sister of battle at this point, but the hell it's giving me the paint and the warbler. Okay, but, but do it in a concealed space and wear a breathing mask. You know? um, but most of the time, I'll I'll give my costumes to uh, close friends who I know will wear them and get joy out of them again. Um, so, like over the last couple of, of years, I've regifted my Nergigante to a friend. I regifted my Death Guard to a friend. I still have Ari, um, because she's a small costume, so it's easy to yeah. keep. But the bigger ones that I don't have space for, I have to kind of get rid of them before I can make the next one and have space for it. So the Sister of Battle right now has to go 
because I have a Mordred cosplay that I'm working on that needs to space. Do you sometimes push yourself to this, that you say, okay, I just need to get rid of this cosplay and after that I will start a new one, or are you more inconsequent like me? <laughs> yeah. <No. laughs> the amount of space we have is inconsequential to yeah. cosplays get made and much to um, Eric's dismay, <laughs> I'll make something without having the space to like store it or keep it. Um, but I, I found, I mean, I used to be really, really sentimental about them, but getting rid of costumes to me used to be very, very difficult. So I was like, I want to put this, we did this, this together, and we went yeah, to this yeah. convention, and oh, well, this happened in this costume. And then I kind of started giving them to friends, and I was like, okay, fine, well, go and take this one, and that one, and that one. <laughs> like, I, I realized that um, once I, because I make one every month, I don't have a convention to go to every month in them, so they're not going to get the use that they need to get. So uh, I would rather give them to someone else that is going to wear them than them sit and collect dust yeah. in like my garage and nobody's using them. Like I've put so much effort into them, at least someone needs to wear them, you know? So a friend of mine, she has done all of the Disney princesses and she has a creepy collection of hats with wigs on them in her room, <laughs> like in her living room. It's, it's, really, it's really creepy. <laughs> Um, because of all the white styrofoam hats and then the, the wigs just on them, how do you store your wigs at home? Um, my wigs do not get such a lavish treatment. <laughs> they, I mean, I used to store them on wig heads, but they just got covered in dust. Yes. So I stopped doing that. I'd rather put it in a wig bag and shove it in my box and then pull it out and restyle it than have them get dirty and get um, dust on them. Because I really did for a long time. I wanted to have them on display. So they looked pretty and then like a couple months later, I would look at the wig and I'm like, this is disgusting, this has got dust on it. Is no, I want to wear this and I have to wash it and I have to ruin the styling anyway. So I, I decided um, I'll just squash it in the box and deal with it when I need to wear it again. And what is your next costume you're going to do? I have, I have a very big list of potential costumes that need to get done that I want yeah. as like a priority. I have like the top five priorities that kind of comes out every couple of months. <laughs> Depends so, on uh, yeah, the depends on what's happening at the time. Um, so one one of the problems now when we get back is um, we've got World Cosplay Summit coming up at the end of July, early August. So I have to try and finish the Mordred costume from Fate that I was working on, which I made. I need to face it, be mad because this is like the cosplay championship of the world, and I kind of want to have a good costume for that. Um, so that's going to take a little bit of time, but I need to make a new costume as well. So it's kind of going to be a little bit of a balancing act and like a juggling act of creating something new while fixing something old in preparation for that competition as well. So I'm not actually sure what I'm making when I get home. <laughs> so the, um, the championships is the next thing you're doing after this? Yeah. So um, World Cosplay Summit is um, the world championships of cosplay where teams of two from I think it's 43 countries go um, to Japan to compete for the cosplay championship. Um, so uh, we are representing South Africa this year. Um, we had a World Cosplay Summit for the first time last year. So this is our second opportunity to go over and try and compete and see what happens and represent the country. And I'm really excited to be able to meet all the other teams and see the other representatives and just be part of it because it's going to be such a cool experience to like bring people from all over the world, like 43 yeah. countries. And cause that just like shows how global a phenomenon cosplay has become. So do you do that together with Eric or? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I, w I would have loved for Eric to do it with me, but uh, Eric's never cosplayed before, so I'm slowly trying to get him into it. But for now, you need a more reliable part. Yeah, uh, so I would have loved for him to join and um, partner with me, but uh, I actually partnered with a friend of mine who I've been cosplaying with for probably seven years now. Wow. She was one of the first people I met in my cosplay community. Um, she's a really, really great seamstress, so it kind of worked really well because my armor, my costume was completely armored. Her costume was a very, very much sewing related. It was saber from um, Fate, so it's this big ball gown. I made the armor on top of it, so it was like both of our skill sets combined into one. So oh, that's perfect. Yeah, and she's just super, super charismatic as well. So um, a big part of World Cosplay Summit is the performance aspect. You have to do like the stage performance, and she's really, really good with 
um, baton twirling. So if she like has a sword thing and she swings a sword around so wow. it, it, it That is such it. a nice skill. It always yeah. reminds me of like the Miss USA uh, thing. Yeah. <laughs> baton twirling is just something so pageanty. I know, right? <laughs> Yeah, talking about friends in cosplay, do you like have um, a lot of friends around in the house or in your city? Or do you have more like cosplay friends all around the world? Yeah, um, I have a lot of local cosplay friends in South Africa, but they're not in my city, uh, which, which sucks a lot. Cause, um, I live in Johannesburg, which mm. is kind of central South Africa, and most of my friends live in Cape Town, which is uh, about a uh, two-hour flight away. Even my, my WCS partner, Genevieve, she's she's from Cape Town, so when we were doing the practices for the performance, she had to come up for like a week, and we had to do the performance, and then she'd go away, and then well, we went to like the long distance, the whole um, championship like uh, early stages, so it was really difficult. She'll be coming up uh, when we come back now so we can go over it again and like try and perfect it. But um, I would really love to be able to have more people over and do like crafting sessions and stuff. I'm really jealous of everybody that is in Cape Town because they do that all the time. It just happened that like most of my friends were not from the same region that I'm from, which is a little bit sad. <laughs> and are your friends from home also into cosplay or are they more like doing there in the cosplay. I mean, other than like my cosplay friends, I don't really have any friends. I'm so like, I got my cosplay and I got Eric and that is my life. And like, we have a crazy cat lady story <laughs> because my cat sat on this cave and tried to ruin it while I was sewing it. So I'm really into cat story. Yeah, I mean, the, we, we actually have a new kitten now. We didn't plan to get a kitten. He, he just showed up one day. Um, he, we found him in the back of our, our yard, I think, four weeks ago. He's like brand new. Uh, but he, is, he is a monster. <laughs> He's just a little, a little devil. Um, I have a photo of me taking progress photos of the Raftalia costume. And you see, like, in the first photo, he's like on the side of the mirror. And in the second photo, he's closer. And then he's jumped on my leg. Done. Like attacking my leg. So it's like documented proof of like his shenanigans. Thank you for sharing that. I think we are being played out like the Oscars. <laughs> <laughs> we would like to thank you so much for participating in this because it's been such a fun hour or three quarters of an hour. And um, uh, we want to give you the chance to just address anything you want to say, some events, some uh, social media channels, whatever you want to do. Um, just take shot at you. Thank you guys so much for having me. I had so much fun um, being part of this panel with you guys. You guys are awesome. Germany is awesome. Thank you guys so much for having me back again. I've had such an amazing time. Day one, and I'm really looking forward to the rest of the weekend. If you guys do want to find my work, um, we have a website, kimpatsukosplay.com, with all our social media and our tutorials and patterns and stuff. <laughs> right there! <laughs> Yeah, so thank you guys so much again for having me, and I hope you guys have an amazing convention further. Thanks, guys. We're gonna switch back to German for the last few sentences. Right. <laughs> Ihr seht hier die Kanäle von Nerdizismus, die haben noch ganz viele andere Podcasts über andere Themen, nicht nur Nerdplay, den ihr da oben in der Mitte seht, sondern auch noch über verschiedene andere Themen. Wenn ihr das mal checken wollt, nerdizismus.de, ganz einfach. Und den Podcast gibt es dann, sobald wir geschnitten haben, auf iTunes, Spotify und auf der Homepage. Vielen Dank fürs Dasein. Danke, dass ihr hört und danke, Ken Patzung.